Uh, my name is Duncan Wittick, um, and be half of Canada's nonprofit outdoor learning store um, and our outdoor learning partners. I'd like to warmly welcome you here this evening. Um, I am very grateful to be joining you here from the Rocky Mountain Trench in the homelands of the Tanaha and the Shushwap. And hi everyone, my name is Farheen. I'm located in the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people, to whom I'm grateful for um, their stewardship and their knowledge about the land, which is otherwise known as Toronto. And I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of Take Me Outside, one of the 20 outdoor learning partners who are co-hosting this great outdoor learning virtual series. Thanks, Raheen. And this is our second in the series tonight. Uh, and we're lucky to have David Sobel with us, who will be introducing shortly. Uh, and we know in the context of outdoor learning, it is fundamental for us to develop our understanding of Indigenous knowledge and perspective in our landscapes. Um, and so we encourage you to consider what you can do to deepen your own understanding in your own place. And also, if you'd like, we'd invite you to share what Indigenous territory you're joining us from in the, in the chat. And while you take a moment to do that, we also want to acknowledge that this is a very challenging time for everyone um, in different ways. However, we are heartened by the fact that we know that outdoor learning and connecting with nature is a highly effective way of fostering better health for all of us humans and our planet. So which is why we're very excited to be able to offer this session this evening. For sure. And uh, how many people do we have in here now, Jade? 418 and 418, that's fantastic. And uh, in the registrations we saw for most people, they indicated where they were coming from, but we wanted to get a real time pulse of that. So we've got a couple survey, a couple polls here for you. So the first one is, where are you joining us from? And so you can respond there. If you're coming from somewhere in Canada, maybe the United States, maybe somewhere else on this beautiful planet Earth. I'll give you a few more seconds there. It looks like a race between British Columbia and Ontario right now, with Alberta not far behind. Okay, three, two, one. And I'll share the results with you here. So we do have people from nearly every neck of the woods, uh, a lot of British Columbians and Ontarionians, but lots of other folks as well. Um, so we're going to do one more poll just to see what, what types of people are joining us tonight. What types of educators? Are you an early years educator, a K to three teacher, four to seven teacher, secondary teacher? Maybe you're a community educator, or maybe you're just not an educator, but you're really, really excited to be here. So I'll give you a few more seconds to vote here. Looks like K to three teachers are taking the lead with early years educators close behind. And I know those are mixed, you know, some of you K to three teachers might be saying, but I'm also an early years educator. Don't worry. Okay, so we've got, yeah, a lot of K to three teachers, uh, a lot of early years educators, over a hundred. And then, yeah, somebody, at least one or two people from every other group. So wonderful to see such a diversity of educators here tonight. Okay, so now that we've got the majority, I'm hoping of people in the room, um, for those of you who are more familiar with other platforms than Zoom, um, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat icon, you can click on that, you can pose questions in the chat. Uh, throughout. Farheen and Jade will be monitoring that and Farheen will be collecting up um, questions for later for, for David. Um, we would encourage you to keep yourself on mute for now. Um, there may be an opportunity later to pose questions uh, off of mute, but if you want to keep your video on, it is so nice, especially these days, to see 
the faces of, uh, of people, real human beings around the country and around the world. So uh, feel free and you can scroll through. If uh, you can go up to the top right corner, there's a view button. You can go to gallery view and then you can click through the pages and um, you know, you can wave to people as you <laughs> scroll through if you want. Uh, so just a nice chance to connect as a community here tonight. Um, tonight, the way it'll flow is following the introduction. Um, David's got a wonderful 20, 25 minute presentation lined up. After that, Farheen will be facilitating a Q&A with him. We've got some prizes, some great prizes we'll be drawing at the end. And then for those who wanna stick around, David has offered some additional time beyond the 60 minutes to answer some more questions, have some smaller group discussion, that sort of thing. Um, this is being recorded. And so you will have access to the recording. We'll send out a link tomorrow with that. Plus a link, you can access a certificate of attendance because I know a lot of you, especially early years educators require that. So we will provide that um, in an email that will come out uh, by tomorrow. All right, thanks, Duncan. So welcome everyone to session two of the series. The Canadian Outdoor Learning Spring Virtual Workshop Series is brought to you by a group of 20 partners from across the country, all of whom offer excellent outdoor and environmental education resources, programs, and support. Duncan and I are going to provide a quick overview of each of these partners, and Jade from our Canadian nonprofit outdoor learning store. She'll pop the links in the chat so you can check it out if you want. I'm going to start with Take Me Outside. Take Me Outside raises awareness and facilitates action on nature connection and outdoor learning in schools across Canada through initiatives such as Take Me Outside Day and Take Me Outside Learning School, Take Me Outside for Learning School Year Challenge. Uh, Canada's not-for-profit outdoor learning store offers the Take Me Outside Weatherproof student journals that we'll also be giving out at the end of the workshop. And we've got the Pacific Foundation for the Understanding of Nature, which is an amazing foundation. They're actually offering a thousand dollar gift card for next year's Take Me Outside for Learning School Year Challenge. So you can check that out on Take Me Outside's website. So we thank them for that. ECOM is Canada's national bilingual and charitable umbrella network for environmental learning. And they just held their conference over the weekend and I know a good number of people here were there and uh, yeah, we had a great time. Um, Green Teacher uh, is actually, Dave and I, David was just talking about this before the webinar. They're, they're not only a magazine, which they're traditionally known as, but they also offer webinars and podcasts. Okay. Um, and we at the Outdoor Learning Store offer several of their educator resources and we're also partnering with them on a podcast called Earthy Chats. Green Learning offers free online education programs about energy, climate change, and green economy that engages and empowers students to create positive change for our evolving world. And Natural Curiosity is an amazing framework uh, that many of you might have heard of um for inquiry-based learning stewardship uh and they've they've framed their new edition around uh, the importance of indigenous perspectives so their resource book is available on our outdoor learning store and um it's also they're also hosting a webinar in a couple weeks with us so be sure to sign up for that one next we have water rangers water rangers supports a collection of data on their free open data platform all with the goal of providing communities with the tools they need to take care of our lakes, rivers, and oceans. Their water testing kits are also available on the Outdoor Learning Store. Awesome. And I should have put in there too, they're hosting a, a workshop next week. Uh, mm -hmm. So next Tuesday, you can join us with their team and they're actually gonna do a live demo outdoors with their kits. Uh, and Seabean, which I get the privilege of being their executive director is a, it's an amazing network uh, here in Southeast BC and uh, we host the nonprofit outdoor learning store as a charitable social enterprise that supports not just us, but other organizations from around the country. Uh, EEPSA is BC's Environmental Educators Provincial Specialist Association, providing networking, curriculum support, and leadership for teachers. They piloted Canada's nonprofit outdoor learning store in BC in partnership with CBEAN. 
And Wild Titan is an incredible uh, organization that is a spokesperson ad and advocate for wild spaces and helps to connect children um, and all ages with nature around us. The Global Environmental and Outdoor Education Council is your resource for teaching in the area of global environmental and outdoor education. They offer conferences, workshops, teaching ideas, and other information. And Sask Outdoors uh, is your prairie connection to outdoor recreation and environmental responsibility. They have lots of great workshops and webinars and all different types of uh, ways you can look, develop your skills and knowledge of the land. Alberta Council for Environmental Education works collaboratively to advance environmental education in Alberta so that today's students have the knowledge and skills to build a sustainable future. They work to move environmental education from the margins to the mainstream, all while giving students hope for the future and empowering them to become active environmental stewards. Every time we go the, to, through this, I think, wow, what an incredible array of organizations we have access to. Uh, we've got Stoked on Science and Jade from Stoked on Science is helping us out today. They deliver awesome uh, outdoor science-based programs that connect young people to the world around them. Next, we have Get Outside and Play. Get Outside and Play offers resources, workshops, and consulting services to support nature connection and outdoor experiences for young children. And the Ontario Society for Environmental Education, or OC, provides a fantastic place for educators to go to find information on environmental topics uh, to integrate in their teaching practice. And sign up now. They've got their Ecolinks uh, conference which looks amazing. Uh, so definitely check it out. It's, and it's very cheap. I think it's a sliding scale of like $0 to $40. Um, so highly recommend checking that out and signing up. Class Classrooms to Communities or C2C is a made in BC collaborative of partners committed to providing place-based educational leadership and support through a suite of strategies, events, and activities. And the Kootenai Boundary Environmental Ed Group is actually Canada's first and I think only collaborative effort by school superintendents to promote uh, and engage in place-based outdoor learning. And so we're excited to partner with them. LSF, or Learning for a Sustainable Future, works to integrate the concepts and principles of sustainable development into education policy, school curriculum, teacher education, and lifelong learning across Canada. And they offer a variety of resources and workshops that you can find on their website. And last but not least, Imagine Ed, who if you're at the workshop last week, you would have um, gotten to know Jillian Judson, who is the catalyst for Imagine Ed. And um, it's an incredible blog and resources for outdoor learning. They're also hosting the Walking Curriculum Challenge. And you, can, you have one week left to sign up for that and you can find out more on the link there. Okay, <laughs> so is that enough partners? That uh, there certainly are more amazing organizations out there, but that is a good number of them that we are lucky to have access to across this country. So without further ado, we wanted to introduce uh, a man who probably needs no introduction. He's been working in this field for over 30 years. Um, David Sobel consults and lectures internationally. He's authored eight books and more than 70 articles. I had the privilege of helping to host him in, on a regional speaking tour when he came up to Canada four years ago and, uh, and really feeling glad despite these times that we get to host him for such a, a, a big group here this evening. So I will take my screen share off and I will invite David to come on board. Welcome David. And you are on mute there. Oh, David, you're just on mute. That's the phrase of the year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thanks to Duncan and Farin for that introduction. I have to admit to a, a kind of a serious case of Canadian envy, um, illustrated in part by the acknowledgement of uh, location on indigenous, un unceded indigenous lands. And uh, the other aspect is I just, whenever I'm in Canada or working with a group of Canadians, I just feel like, oh, I wish I had been born Canadian. So it's always a thrill. <laughs> It's always a thrill to be talking with Canadians. I'm going to focus tonight on uh, nature-based early childhood education and um, with somewhat of a focus on this new book of mine called The Sky Above and the Mud Below, though I'll talk a little bit uh, with, about some material from a previous book of mine. Um, since we're talking about books, I want you to see the, um, the suggested cover from the publisher for this book, uh, you know, when we were in the development process, this was this was the cover that the publishers uh, offered up to me, and I thought, no, no, wait, <laughs> not the right image. Um, so, if you ever get involved in a publishing process, don't feel like you have to kind of go along with whatever the publisher said. Somehow, this just seemed like this child was too angry or too wild or something. Wild is okay, but this is too wild. But let me explain the title of this book. Uh, the title comes from a 1961 documentary film that was about a French Dutch uh, investigation into uh, the highlands of New Guinea. And they were essentially encountering indigenous peoples that hadn't really had any or much contact with uh, the Western world. And um, it, it's, a great, it's a great movie, it won the Foreign Film Academy Award that year. It's a great film about the anthropologists being kind of amazed at the character and you know, the cultural qualities and connection to the land of the indigenous people and the indigenous peoples kind of bemusement and amazement at the white folks coming in to check them out. Uh, I've, always, I've thought of this as a nice metaphor for what, um, what it's like when the people from the child uh, uh, licensing, uh, the child care licensing service comes to nature preschools or forest kindergartens, you know, and they all show up, you know, well-dressed and with shiny shoes on and there are the kids stomping in the mud and smearing mud on their faces. And it's, uh, you know, they kind of, there's two different cultures that don't quite understand each other, but are starting to understand each other. So the sky above and the mud below, I think is a nice image for the, the ethos that's happening in nature preschools and forest kindergartens and in elementary schools that are moving towards more nature-based education. Uh, the frame here, is, you know, why are we doing this stuff? Why are we, you know, why is nature-based early childhood education or nature-based education important? And it comes from this whole cultural shift that's happened over the last 20 or 30 years. So this is a mom's comment uh, from a parenting magazine article. I wanna stand in the front yard and sing out their lovely names at dusk, meaning her, the lovely names of her children and have them suddenly appear in the damp yard around me like little fireflies, but I can't, I can't let them roam I don't have my mother's confidence that the world is a safe place. And then that last line, the golden age of childhood is gone. Well, this, this has certainly been true this year. Um, it was, it's been true over the last 20 years, this whole notion that the world is not a safe place. Therefore, we have to keep our children safe and protected and indoors. And, um, you know, I don't believe that the golden age of childhood is gone, but it's going and it's really our responsibility to figure out how to preserve the golden age of childhood. So the reasons prior to the pandemic for this diminishing outdoor play, you know, we know most of these screen time structured activity, not just working parents, but working uh, mothers, but working parents and working grandparents and working custodial folks, uh, too much school and homework, fear of injuries, right? Can't have kids outside because they're gonna get hurt. So more kids are injured every year falling out of bed than falling out of trees. Um, and then this whole notion of stranger danger, which is something else that's been exaggerated. And you know, the thing that's most dangerous 
for kids is the fact that we put them in cars every day um, and drive them to school or drive them wherever they're going. That's the dangerous thing. Um, so, and then this is the whole disassociation between kids and the natural world is illustrated by this nice uh, press release about a British Columbian group about 10 years ago or a little bit more that was flabbergasted about the J Oxford Junior Dictionary removing words like beaver and dandelion, dodo, bird, and substituting words like, these are even antiquated words now, right? Electronic Blackberry blog, MP3 player. So when, when, the, when the lexicon changes, you know, when the word bank is changing, that means that the culture norm is changing. And so this is really an indicator that, you know, children are becoming isolated from the natural world. I always say kids are becoming uh, indoorified and um, uh, couch potato-ified and, uh, and there's an academification of early childhood. And those are all things that we have to counter in this work that we do in nature-based education. So this is the cover of a, the previous book and I think it's her expression is what it's all about. You know, we want to reintroduce joy into uh, early childhood and early and elementary education. And I want to start with a, a piece from, I want to take a look at this whole notion of, you know, we talk a lot about nature-based education being play-based and um, there's a lot of confusion about what, what does play-based curriculum mean? So I'm gonna show you one ex a couple of examples before moving into material from the Sky Above book. Um, this is a nice picture from the Chippewa Nature Preschool in Michigan. Um, so this is a great uh, graphic from a book, a piece called Crisis in the Kindergarten. And in this book, the authors talk about this curriculum continuum at the right side of the continuum is didactic, highly structured classrooms with teacher-led instruction. And on the left side is laissez-faire, loosely structured classrooms. And the authors say that neither ends of this continuum really serve children well. Too structured, too unstructured, neither of them are really productive. What we really want is examples from the middle of this continuum where there's this nice interplay between uh, what children's initiated play activities are and what teachers do with their play activities, or teachers being thoughtful about designing activities that are going to engage children playfully. So I want to illustrate what this looks like. So this is from a, a, an independent school in Richmond, Virginia. Um, it's a kind of Reggio, uh, school, but has a nature-based orientation as well. And um, about eight or 10 years ago, they started going into a city park that was just adjacent to their school. And the kids oriented to this fallen down tree. And they oriented, two different groups of kids oriented towards either end of, here, I'm just all the second looking for something. Nope, don't have it. Um, the either end of the tree, Mostly a group of boys were doing deconstruction. They were trying to loose the trunk from the stump. They wanted to knock that big trunk of the tree off. And the other end of the tree, the kids were doing fabrication. Uh, they had created a chocolate factory and they were creating a history museum of artifacts that they found in the tree. And so the kids kind of operated parallel play, not really interacting much. The kids from the fabrication end also liked walking on the tree up towards the stump. Um, and so, but then there started to be this natural resource controversy uh, where Stella from the fabrication group said, well, you know, people come down here just for this tree. It's a special tree. People like climbing on the tree. In other words, she wanted the boys to stop the deconstruction activity. And Luke said, well, you can always climb on another you can always climb on other things and make another climbing tree. So the, uh, fabricate, the deconstruction boys agreed that if anybody was walking on the tree or sitting on the tree, they wouldn't do deconstruction. So then 
a Reese decides to initiate a nonviolent sit-in. Essentially, he sits on the tree during the whole of outdoors time so that the boys can't do deconstruction. And then there starts to be this dialogue about, you know, a kind of a, a debate of for and against. And so the teachers brought the debate back inside the classroom. And she or and the teachers orchestrated a debate between the kids. So the deconstruction kids said, uh, persistence is good, like in the Iliad. This is, of course, what we want all young children to do is to be quoting classic literature to support their arguments. Uh, Drew said, it's going to be fun to watch when it falls and it'll make a big cloud of dirt. That idea actually appealed to me. The against deconstruction kids were saying, leave nature alone. It's part of the forest and animal habitat. It'll squish us when it falls. So what the teachers have done here is they've taken a natural play activity, something that was unstructured, and they've recruited it to orchestrating uh, 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 you know, nicely, uh, nicely argued uh, debate between two different groups of kids. Now, in the United States, in the common core key points in writing, one of, the one of the things that we're trying to develop in kids is the ability to write logical arguments based on substantive claims, sound reasoning, and relevant evidence. And so my contention is that what the teachers were doing here was developing the precursors to that common core point or aspect of learning. You know, they were helping kids learn how to take a stand and argue for what they believed in. They were using literature and history to support their argument, that reference to the Iliad. They were recruiting others to help support their position and they were recognizing that nonviolent action can be a method for making a point. That part, the last part there is not so much a common core writing point, but something else that I think is valuable. So this is a nice example of taking something from the unstructured learning end of the continuum and moving it into the center. Here's another example uh, from the Juniper Hill School in Alna, Maine, where the kids uh, in late winter had um, same kind of thing, uh, a, a natural play area that, that developed into uh, creating a bakery. And the kids had actually set up a bakery on a fallen down tree they found an old set of shelves and they were making vanilla pudding and uh, chocolate cakes. And uh, this one, this child made nut bread. And um, the teacher took the activity that was again, unstructured learning and said, okay, well, let's, let's, write, the, let's write the recipe for what goes into nut bread. You know, have a cup of wood chips, two cups of mud, four teaspoons of sawdust, and then the baking instructions. The next step was, um, and these are, you know, five, I think these four, five, and six year olds. The next step was to work with the local tea room. And the baker at the tea room actually chose recipes or fabricated recipes that mirrored the things that the kids had made outside. So the vanilla pudding kid that who had used sawdust and snow was making vanilla pudding for real. And the nut bread kid had to make the recipe for nut bread using a real recipe for nut bread. Uh, great literacy and math being developed here. And then the kids held a, a, a formal tea for their parents and served the baked goods. And there was that whole process of, you know, how do you do the, the mise en place aspect of creating a nice tea for people. So again, something that started as a play activity that got recruited into a learning activity. So when we talk about play-based uh, education, play-based nature uh, education, this is what I think is the optimal piece. Sometimes you've got really unstructured stuff. Sometimes you've got really teacher-directed stuff, but sometimes you're looking for this sweet spot in the middle. So now I'm gonna talk about some materials from the sky above and the mud below. Duncan, I don't have my clock right here. So about how much, how much longer should I go for? Well, you know, we don't have a set time right. here. Uh, we do have that hour end, but yeah, um, but, I'd say if you went for, you know, 10, even 15, 15 minutes, that would be, good. that would be great. Good. Great. Okay. Um, so essentially what I want to do is is point out some of the greatest hits from this book. Now, this book was constructed by 
my working with 18 different uh, <sighs> graduates that were working at um, different early childhood programs around the country. And they were documenting the ways in which they were naturalizing their early childhood programs. And so I chose all the best of those. And there's about 70 or 80 of these little articles in the book. And then I framed them all into uh, chapters. So I'm gonna, I wanted to, I wanted to share some of the ones that I thought were really kind of uh, interesting and unusual. Some of them more conventional, but some unusual. So the first section of the book is about getting organized. This stuff is not unusual, but just, okay, if you're gonna do this stuff, this is, you really have, these are the things you gotta do. Uh, uh, so there's a couple, some really good articles on infrastructure. You know, and so a lot of, in a lot of cases, this is actually from a forest days program in Vermont. This is one day a week in the woods with Vermont public school kindergartners year round. And what's happened in all these uh, public school kindergarten in Vermont is that the teachers have learned how to develop really good infrastructure, seating, campfires, storage, uh, outdoor, uh, you know, toileting uh, facilities. All this stuff is really integral to making the outdoor piece work, whether you're doing it a day a week or half day a week, or it's, you know, you need good outdoor infrastructure. You also need um, uh, a really conscientious program on appropriate clothing. Um, this is from a, the Forest Gnomes Vald Kindergarten in Natick, Massachusetts. Uh, these lists have gotten more and more specialized and specific as they've gone along. So you have to provide these guidelines to parents and you have to come up with a system for providing gear to kids who can't afford it. Um, you know, so you create lending libraries, uh, you give opportunities for parents to, you know, bring in their uh, leftover stuff, hand it off to others, teachers shop at used clothing stores for things. So you've always got a supply of things there. Without appropriate clothing, these programs really fall apart and you really have to uh, make it clear that this has to happen. You need a predictable schedule. You don't just take the kids outside and say, okay, we're gonna go out and play. So this is a nice example of the Woods Day schedule in the Teton Valley Community School in Victor, Idaho. Uh, this is, you know, in Victor, Idaho, you would presume the kids would just go out the back door. Not true. They basically have to bust the kids to a national forest site. You know, so they get woods ready, they take the bus, they arrive at the site. They start with small group exploration that's more teacher directed. Then there's whole class free play and there's lunch and going back on the bus. And then there's the reflection at the end of the day. There's always a balance in what I think are the really exemplary programs between the, the child initiated play and the teacher directed activities. So an even emphasis on both of those things. They also have three primary rules and um, I like this set of rules. It doesn't really matter what the rules are. You need, you need to have a set of rules uh, and they have to be some variation on this. And then they, uh, one of the activities they always do is have kids illustrate the rules back in the classroom. But they do with animal drills is not one of the rules, but it's something that gets taught to the kids. Um, and so back in the classroom, this is one of the children's illustrations of the big animal drills. In this case, you know, they have to be concerned about the big animals are basically mostly bear and moose. But in this case, the big animal that the kids had to, this child was concerned about was the unicorn. And I love the fact that there's places where you can still encounter unicorns in the wild. I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, Here's some, of the, here's some of the more interesting things that have started to show up. Outdoor rest time. You know, in, in Scandinavia and Europe, this has been much more of a, of a thing. And, uh, you know, it's just starting to show up in the United States where, you know, instead of having nap time indoors, you have nap time outdoors when it's suitable. Um, and some schools like at Juniper Hill, you know, they've got uh, hammocks and they do outdoor rest time in the, you know, not in the coldest part of winter, but in when it's snowy and in the 20s, you know, they'll still do outdoor rest time. Uh, 
Um, so in the beginning, some of the kids didn't like outdoor rest time. By the end, everybody loved it. Uh, family camping weekends. This is a great project that's a collaboration between the Storytellers Children's Center, which is a for mostly uh, foster kids and homeless kids or kids in troubled family situations in Santa Barbara, California, and the Wilderness Youth Project, which is a nature mentoring program. And so they collaborate on doing a family weekend uh, in a local state park with the kids from the Storyteller Center and their families. Winds up mostly be, being for Latinx families. Um, and you know, if you want to change kids' experience in the natural world, what you have to do is change family culture. And this is an attempt to move the families towards the embracing the natural world thing. This is a letter from one of the, I think this was a grandparent letter. Uh, thank you for the invitation to the camp out, unforgettable experience. My childhood memories and feelings came back to my mind with this experience. I could enjoy nature, the river, the stars, the moon. Thank you to each person who made it possible. It was a pleasure to know a little bit more about plants and medicinal uses. I wish from the bottom of my heart that this camp out does not become the only one I could attend. God bless you. So this is a great opportunity for a lot of parents who really haven't had this experience in a long time. Some language arts activities. Uh, this wonderful program done by Sarah Sheldon at the Chicago Botanic Garden where she does, you know, the kids are out on explorations around the botanic gardens and they, they encounter stuff. And then she does dictation as a regular part of her day. And so in this case, they found this rabbit. If you look carefully, you'll see that that's a headless rabbit, in fact. Um, and so the little girl that she's, that's sitting next to her is dictating a story about the headless rabbit. Violet's story. Once upon a time, there was when it was alive and it took its head off from a fox. It was bleeding. Big predator ate it. And the family came to see the dead bunny. Then they took the bunny to the hospital. The doctor came and fixed it. And it was all better, but it was still hurting. So the doctor gave it a big band aid and made it feel better. Then the bunny was better. The bunny went home and took a nap. This is great. This is like the encountering unicorns in the outdoors. I love it where there's places where the bunny can get its head cut chopped off by the fox, but still get made better. So if you're familiar with uh, Vivian Paley's work in uh, storytelling and story acting, this is related to that. So great development of narrative uh, capacities by having children narrate stories and the children see her writing them down. Another language example comes from this program in Michigan, the Michigan State uh, Tolgard Farm Education Center, a one day a week program. Uh, and um, they really try and include kids, diverse kids with diverse uh, primary languages and support this notion of there being lots of languages, both the languages of animals and the languages of different uh, uh, cultural groups. And so this little uh, Korean girl uh, was in the program and at the end of the program the mother wrote a letter saying the most notable change is that she uses English a lot more oftentimes she surprises me by saying whole sentences um, in our perspective it eased our concern about the language barrier this is a thing that's shown up in a lot of uh, programs and we've started to do some documentation of it is how uh, uh, how effective nature-based education is for children who uh, whose primary language is not English and they're learning English and how the engagement with the real world animals and plants and and farming activities and camping activities can help with the whole English language English is the second language back to Santa Barbara um, this was in the math section of the book but what's mostly charming about this is that the teacher uh, uh, knowing that there was this big rain event happening, this was after about a four year drought in Santa Barbara, uh, watched the old Gene Kelly movie uh, called Singing in the Rain in which Gene Kelly dances through the streets, I think it's of Paris, and uh, with an umbrella and um, does all kinds of different activities in the rain, stomping in the puddles, 
standing under gutters and letting the water uh, pour onto the umbrella. So the kids watched the Gene Kelly movie and they went outside and did many of the activities that Gene Kelly does in the rain while he's singing, singing in the rain. They got to do them as well. I thought, what a charming activity. This is one of my favorite examples of the emergent curriculum. And this is gonna be, we're getting towards the end, so I won't go on much longer. Uh, this is the, the nature preschool program in Yorkville, which is suburban Chicago. Uh, and the kids uh, were out and found this geocache box in a tree. Uh, and inside the geocache box was a lot of gold coins or what appeared to be gold coins to the children. They immediately decided that these were hidden there by pirates. So this was pirate treasure. And there was a little, and they, there was a little stream nearby and they decided that the pirates probably hid other pirate treasure and it was probably on the other side of the stream and the kids wanted to figure out how can we get to the other side of the stream. So uh, it would have been, it's in the middle of winter, you know, so getting to the other side of the stream is gonna be a problem. It would have been easy for Megan, who is the teacher to say, gee, you know, the water's too deep, you know, we can't go over there, we're too far away from being back at the classroom. Uh, no, we can't do that. And she, but instead she said, well, I, you know, she wondered how can we get across the stream? And the kid said, sticks, Miss Megan, we could put sticks in the water and float across just like a pirate ship. So she says, okay, let's figure out how to make a pirate ship, uh, you know, that will get them across the river. They had a bunch of uh, different uh, ideas about how to accomplish this. They tried a bunch of things. They tried a bunch of sticking together uh, log uh, branches with glue, a lot of glue, really messy project, didn't work. So they eventually came up with this idea of weaving sticks together. This happened over the course of, you know, two or three or four days. So then they got the raft bridge boat together and they had to get it to the stream, which is a long ways on this kind of steep, uh, rocky, or at least, you know, kind of bumpy terrain. So the kids had to problem solve about how to get this down to the stream. Uh, so they came up with the wagon idea. They had to support the, uh, the bridge in the back because it kept falling off. They had other kids going ahead in front of the wagon to clear the trail. This is, you know, if there was ever a STEM, an appropriate STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math activity for young kids, this was it. They got it down to the stream. This wasn't the actual place where they put it in finally, but they got it down to the stream and it didn't really work as a, as a raft, but it worked as a bridge. And um, so they were able to uh, put it in a place where the stream was narrow enough where they could get across. Uh, so they trundle across on the bridge to the other side. And then, of course, Megan, who's the teacher, is thinking, oh, no, we've gotten to the other side. What happened? They're not going to be able to find any more pirate treasure. So their kind of delight at their own triumph is going to be dashed on the, you know, the stones of like, oh, no, there's no more pirate treasure. However, they got to the other side, there was an area where the stream had receded. It had frozen and then receded and then all the frozen ice had broken into these chunks of ice that glittered and sparkled in the sunlight, just like diamonds. And the kids said, that's the pirate treasure. So they said, you know, uh, you know they were all thrilled that in fact they had gotten across the stream and found the pirate treasure. And then they went on and did stuff with the ice back in their indoor classroom. Uh, so a great example of a teacher uh, both understanding, okay, the kids think this is pirate land, let's go figure out how to get across the stream. She came up, she helped facilitate their decision-making process um, and help them have a, you know, what was really a genuine success in their mind. And this is, you know, as, that other activity, the debate about the fallen tree was, you know, precursors to writing activities. This is a, this is a great early STEM activity. 
it's another example of kind of STEM activities, these hillside tennis ball runs. And it's been fascinating to me to see what I call uh, convergent uh, evolution. That is that the same, you see the same activity with roughly the same materials in completely different parts of the country. So this is a version of it in Heartland, Vermont. And then uh, recently when I was in uh, a preschool programs in uh, Minnesota, on the left-hand side, there's a purple ball uh, that's being channelized to run through that arc of fallen down tree there at the bottom. And then there's this other activity of gutters and wheels. Um, so this same fascination with loose parts assembled to uh, create pathways for balls, uh, great activity that uh, teachers around the country are figuring out. Um, and then the, the whole use of the outdoor environment in urban areas. This is a uh, map flower at the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, where they work with a lot of inner city Head Start programs. And he's got um, you know, concrete and chain link fences to work with. And, he's, and his thrust is, I'm gonna use whatever is outside and nearby to get kids outside and engaged in the natural world, however possible. And you know, whether it means drawing flowers on chalk on the, uh, on the pavement or you know, dragging your hands along the chain link fence to make noises and uh, doing leaf activities in the little pieces of grassy area between the road and the, and the schoolyard. Um, so the idea is, is not just something happening in rural areas or suburban areas, but in downtown areas as well. I'm gonna end with, when I was in British Columbia about four years ago, uh, I uh, was doing some research and found this great article about um, uh, distance learning in the 1920s and 30s done with kids, white settler kids living in isolated parts of British Columbia. And there were a whole series of letters from the kids and the parents back to the university, I think it was UBC uh, folks that were organizing this, back to UBC professors about their uh, learning experiences, and how they were doing uh, you know, at-home learning like everybody's been doing during the pandemic. So this is an excerpt from one of these letters, which I'm not gonna read. But uh, what I found interesting was this comment from the researchers about what they extracted from looking at all these letters. Uh, but the letters demonstrate that the environment has long been a central for shaping the development of children's competencies, skills, worldviews, and to a sense of belonging in communities. And so while white settler parents experienced the environment as a permanent obstacle, children interacted with the natural environment without experiencing the same kinds of anxieties as their parents. I think this is you know, useful in thinking about what it's been like in the pandemic over the past year, is that you know, the, the outdoors has been the saving grace for a lot of these kids and families that are, have been at home. Therefore, nature-based early childhood education should be a birthright of all British Columbian children and by extension, of course, of all Canadian children and by extension, uh, you know, all children deserve nature-based education. And I'm done. <laughs> but not Thank quite. Thank you so much. Yeah, big round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much, David. We we all really loved it. I mean, I know I loved it. I really enjoyed your presentation. And um, looking at the folks in the chat, seems like everyone is definitely on the same page. Lots of great comments um, just throughout the presentation with every little story and lots of room for people to engage with. So um, yeah, we'll send you the chat at the end of the webinar and I'm, I'm sure you'll have a good time reading through that. Um, so for the folks attending, this is the time. Uh, I would encourage you all to type up your questions in the chat. Um, you know, uh, pick David's brain, he's here while you have him, and uh, we'll go through your questions and um, David will answer them for you.
can I help you find those? Yes. Uh, so Jay, if you had uh, the question, questions from earlier, I know I found one um, mm -hmm. that was in the chat before. So we can start there. Um, Beth uh, loves your ideas. She wants help figuring out how to bring some of these ideas to students with developmental disabilities. So maybe if you can provide an example, um, however you want to approach this. Yeah, that's what these are. This is one of the questions that I'm never really great at answering. And that's why we're about to do a conference in a couple of weeks with a woman who runs a program who, and this is her special, this is her specialization. Um, so it's not a long suit of mine. Her point is that uh, you can do this stuff with all kids and it's for all kids, it's uh, really valuable. For kids who are on the, uh, uh, the spectrum, um, there's lots of examples of kids who are uh, fearful of any kind of engagement with natural materials, dirt or, or water. Is it the first time that they actually, the first time they actually uh, get engaged in this stuff is when they're outside. Uh, for kids that have, who are, uh, have attention deficit disorder, uh, the reports are from classroom teachers that it's these kids who can't sit still in the classroom, wind up being the kids that are most uh, uh, take on leadership capacity in the out of doors. Uh, kids that have uh, uh, physical disabilities um, uh, benefit from the, the range of uh, moderate physical challenges that they encounter when they're in the outdoors. And there's wonderful, that wonderful book by, that I'm gonna forget the name of by the occupational therapist. Timber, it's about Timber Nook, which is about uh, this great increase in the range of physical disabilities and occupational therapy needs on the part of kids because they don't move enough. So I, don't I can't give you a, a quick example because it's not something that I've been engaging with recently but lots of the people that work in this area talk about how important it is to uh, figure, give children this opportunity and figure out ways to make it possible for them. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, it's good to have that insight. So um, lots of uh, fun questions coming in. I'll move on to the next one. Um, let's see. So here's a question from Tracy. What do you do when kids just don't like to be outside? What is the best way to encourage them? Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> it, you know, there've been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of this kind of discourse in, um, in Vermont because of this uh, move by public school kindergarten teachers to do this one day a week in the woods. And, um, we did some evaluation of these programs. And in the course of this, we encountered a parent who said, you know, I was really concerned about my kid going outside because she is not an outdoors kid. And after uh, two or three weeks, she switched from a kid that wanted to paint her fingernails to a kid that was, uh, you know, uh, bringing rocks home in her pockets. So what the what has been the account of a lot of these Vermont teachers that I've been working with is that, yeah, in the beginning, there's lots of kids that, um, that don't wanna do the outdoors thing. And uh, the approach to them is to find a comfortable place for them to be outside and don't make them do much of anything, right? And, uh, but let them be able to watch what other kids are doing and get recruited by other kids uh, when, you know, when it's possible. And so there just aren't a lot of examples of kids that don't wind up being engaged. Um, so I think in the beginning, the idea is not to force it uh, and to make them as comfortable as possible and then gradually uh, hope that they're gonna you know, find uh, that some kids are gonna invite them into the outdoor activities that are so appealing. Nice, I definitely agree. There. Um, th thank you. So the next question is from Jasmine. Do you have 
any examples of a heavy rainy day, what that would look like in terms of activities and um, what do you do to inspire play? A heavy, a heavy rainy day, is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, so um, umbrellas are a really good, are a really good thing. We've kind of encouraged uh, in some school programs to you know, get a set of classroom umbrellas. Um, and um, what, uh, and in most of these, again, these uh, programs in Vermont, uh, some form of outdoor shelter is really crucial. So if it's really raining heavily, uh, it's really hard to be outside. Uh, and so you need to have some kind of uh, facility so that you can be sheltered and um, not getting soaked to the bone within 10 minutes. So umbrellas are good, but umbrellas are not gonna manage it. So I think you have to have outdoor shelters, really good reindeer, rain gear, really good umbrellas, um, and uh, good activities that take advantage of the fact that it's raining. So all the, the, some of those examples from the singing in the rain thing of, of puddle stomping and following streams and um, damming up streams that are forming uh, and figure and looking for erosion. Um, but you also have to understand the limits of what's tolerable for kids and that sometimes if it's raining too heavily, being out in it just isn't worth it. Uh, thank you, David. The next question is from um, Crystal. What is the most important piece of advice that you can give to us as we begin our first forest kindergarten this fall? So the one thing that educators must be prepared for. I, I think it's the appropriate, I think it's the clothing issue. I think you have to, um, you know, people underestimate the clothing challenge in the beginning. Um, and so there, you have to do a lot of uh, parent education ahead of time. You have to provide very specific guidance on, uh, on gear. And um, there was a really good New York Times wire cutter article recently by a couple of nature-based early childhood educators on specific brands of specific outerwear. Um, and you, the thing I was saying before about um, you have to develop a stockpile of gear, of rain boots and rain suits that are usable for kids that don't come with them. So no matter how well you do the parent education thing, some kids are, some parents aren't gonna be able to afford it and some parents are just not gonna do it. So you have to have enough set of a gear so that you can provide it for kids. And um, so you need to do that in advance of everybody going outside. The other, the other, the secondary thing is don't think of this as we're going outside and we're gonna do free play the whole time because that's a, an invitation for problems. You know, so the thing I said about having a, coming up with a good predictable schedule that, uh, that allows kids to feel some being held is really important. So this might be a good place to do a soft closing and then David's offered to stick around for longer, you know, for a smaller, smaller group, maybe of just a couple hundred of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know, Farheen, did you want to draw your prizes first or? Sure, um, let's do it. Uh, so we have two weatherproof journals to give away from Take Me Outside. So I'm just gonna randomly choose some folks from um, the participant list, and then we'll follow up with you later and get your mailing address and all that fun stuff. So the first winner is Julia Greenlaw. Right Yay, on. Julia. Yay. Um, so Duncan has just put a link to the journal um, in the comment section. Feel free to check it out, check out your prize. And the next winner we have is Tia Sar Sarazin. I hope I pronounced that right, but sorry if I didn't. So congratulations to Tia and Julia. 
we are gonna get you a uh, weatherproof journal from uh, Take Me Outside and Outdoor Learning Store. And while we while I have you here, Take Me Outside is also having a t-shirt sale. So if you're on our website, feel free to check it out. I'll pop the link in the chat in just a second. Awesome, thanks Farheen. And if you're with us last week, I showed you that I was wearing my Take Me Outside t-shirt. Well, this week I have my other one on and it is equally as awesome. So, uh, and I just ordered two more. So I have one for Monday to Thursday now. <laughs> um, so anyway, they're great. Um, on behalf of Canada's Out Outdoor Learning Store, we have a $50 gift card to give away tonight. Um, and in case you didn't know, I think all of you probably do by now, the, the nonprofit Outdoor Learning Store is a social enterprise we've started. It's run by a charity. It's run for charitable activities to support charitable activities and to give everyone in Canada an easy one-stop shop for your outdoor learning needs. So we, we love to receive feedback and ideas for new things to add. And tonight, our winner, Emma White. <laughs> Congrats, Emma. We will follow up with you by email with your gift card. And everyone, if you haven't received it already, we'll follow up tomorrow with a 5% discount code that we're pleased to offer all of our workshop participants until a week after our final workshop. So it's valid until, I guess that's May 28th. So we'll send that out to you tomorrow. So if you have to leave us now, thanks for joining. We hope you can join us next week for two more uh, workshops. Um, and just a big thanks from our team and all of our partners to David for joining us tonight and for sharing some of your wisdom. I'm sure you could talk for hours and hours and hopefully we'll have you back on again soon. Okay, and I think Farheen, uh, you're transferring over the Q&A to myself and Jade here. Yep, um, I'm just gonna hand it over to you guys. Uh, Duncan, and I did put some of the questions that were on the chat in um, at the bottom of our script. So they're still there and feel free to find them. And yeah, um, it was great being a part of this and it was great getting to know you and listening to you, David. I'm gonna head out, but all of you feel free to stay on and chat with David and, and get him to answer your questions. <clears throat> Perfect, thank you. So Jade, I know you were capturing a few questions. Were there any burning questions that you thought were great to share at this point? Absolutely. David, can I get you to stop your screen share so that we can see your face bigger and more? It'd be great to, uh, to have that focus. Um, okay, one of the questions um, that got me so people were saying we often read and hear the belief that if children are connected to nature they're more likely to steward the environment better as adults do you know of any academic studies that have been done to validate this assumption whoa that's a that's a long presentation <laughs> <laughs> um, many is the answer right um yes many um the best if somebody's really interested in this, uh, I think it's I think it's a chapter, and I could I would actually I'd be happy to send this to you guys, and then you could distribute it to whoever is interested. Uh, I think it's called the development of conservation <laughs> behavior in children, and it's by Louise Chowla and Vic. Uh, I can't remember the other uh, co-author. But they, in this chapter, they looked at hundreds of different studies and then summarized the findings. And so the findings are that in fact, uh, children's play in the natural world is one of the things that correlates most highly with the development of uh, environmental attitudes and stewardship behavior in adults. Um, there was a great study yeah, there've been a number of studies that looked at that whole relationship. So it's not really a, um, there's not really any question about whether this is a valid scientific finding anymore at all. It's been, it's well validated in lots of cross-cutting studies. Um, so the one of the findings that from another study that Louise Chowla did was that 
the two things that make a different the two things that make a difference in uh, people that became environmentalists. This is different from kind of broad in, environmental stewardship behavior in the broad population. But in environmentalists, the two things that made a difference were access to free play in the natural world and an adult who fostered environmental uh, values and attention. And so those are, the, those are the two elements that are really an integral part of nature-based early childhood programs is the access to play in the natural world and the modeling of environmental care and environmental attention. So again, as I said, happy to provide that summary article, which then has reference to the hundreds of different studies that they were looking at. That would be great. Amazing. To share that out. Um, I've got a question here from Michaela. Michaela was wondering if you could speak about the problems of getting um, nature activities and their perceived dangers insured. She, she, and the, you know, the case in the U.S. may be slightly different from Canada, but um, if you have insurance with or uh, experience with insurance and these types of activities, you know the case in the United States is worse than it is in Canada. So, uh, so this is something that every this is something that all programs go through, and um, you know the Natural Start Network in the United States, which is run by the North American Alliance for Environmental Education. They have a separate little uh, uh, organization called Natural Start, which focuses on nature-based early childhood. And there's a, um, there's a listserv for people in programs. And this is one of the questions that comes up on the listserv frequently. And what winds up happening is that people who run programs will recommend insurers who have been, who are understanding of the virtue of this. Now, it's good to provide a little context here. Uh, Sharon Danks, who runs the Green Schoolyards organization, uh, talks about uh, this great example from Berlin, Germany, where they, um, this one big insurance company that insures a lot of Berliners uh, looked at um, the relationship between childhood play and uh, adult ac accidents. Uh, and they found out that kids who had more active uh, outdoor play and riskier play in childhood tended to have fewer accidents in adulthood and therefore uh, uh, you know, registered fewer insurance claims. And so the insurance company in Berlin started to fund the development of higher, of more risky play elements in playgrounds, right? So this is a, for instance, of the insurance company recognizing that outdoor nature play is valuable. So there have been a bunch of studies. I think Evergreen has done, in Toronto has done some of these studies that look at the frequency of accidents on conventional playgrounds versus on naturalized playgrounds. And in some cases, they're about the same. In some cases, the naturalized playgrounds or the natural area, the frequency of accidents is lower. So, um, so you have to kind of provide insurers with this kind of information. And there is good research on this stuff. So, you know, one of the things you have to do is find the research. The other thing is you have to just start asking around and asking colleagues about, okay, who who did who's the insurer who does your insurance policy for your program? And you know, some people don't want to touch it, and some uh, some people are understand the virtue of it. Also, good to look at the new uh, guidelines in Washington. I'm probably aware of the fact that there's been this five year study of how to develop appropriate guidelines for nature-based preschool programs. And the five-year study is over and legislation just passed within the last couple of weeks, I think, to provide, to formalize the a new set of guidelines for uh, uh, approving and certifying outdoor, nature-based outdoor early childhood programs. And so the, the fact that that exists with 
you know, through state legislation in the United States is also a good thing to refer to if you're working with um, insurers that, okay, here are state guidelines for this. Yes, these programs are different than conventional early childhood programs, but they're just as safe, if not safer. Beautiful, thank you for that. That's some really good context to consider. Um, Jade, did you have a... Yeah, I'm quite interested in this one. And I know that we're looking at this a little bit with the uh, C-Beam, um, but the question from Alison is, outdoor education programs can lack representation from minority populations. Do you have any ideas for making outdoor environmental education more culturally responsive? It says responsive, but I think responsible is the word. No, I think she means responsive, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's the, that's the term that's used a lot. Um, okay, sorry, excuse yeah. me. It's, um, there's a lot of work going on this on in this area in the United States right now. Um, and again, being done by the folks at Natural Start. Um, one, one of the issues is um, the length of the day of the program, the length of the program day. Uh, so for lots of uh, low income folks or for, uh, you know, folks from different cultural groups that need to be working full time, the whole idea of a half day pro early childhood program is preclusive. They can't participate in it. So there's a lot of, so in, the, in some programs that really are trying to figure out, okay, how do we make our program accessible and appealing to the wider range of cultural and socioeconomic groups is you have to figure out a ways to do full day programming. Um, then you have to figure out a way uh, to do to subsidize tuition. Now, the little the tiny trees program in Seattle, which runs inner city, uh, you know, nature based preschool programs in about six different Seattle parks. Um, they uh, they both keep their tuition low by not having any facilities and. Um, and then have, they've worked really hard to hire culturally diverse staff members who then appeal to culturally diverse populations of people. Um, the, other, the other element there was, you know, if you're gonna do this outdoor stuff, you really need the gear. So you have to, you have to take on the responsibility for gear provision for parents who can't afford it or parents who aren't used to like, kids being outside in the cold for long periods of time. So those are a few ways to start thinking about it. Um, oh, there was another, I, there was something else. I think those are all really great points yeah. to, to bring um, things to the forefront. All right. And somebody's posted that the um, Council of Outdoor Educators of Ontario, Laurie's posted, is hosting a conference this weekend on decolonizing outdoor education and addressing anti-Black or anti-racist education. And you can find that at www.coeo.org. You know, there was, I, I realized that the thought was we were doing a program, a uh, place-based education program in Boston for a number of years and working with a lot of inner city schools, schools that mostly had African-American uh, school populations and parents. And, and there was a study done of the cultural responsiveness of our program and a couple of other programs. And in the process of that, there was a lot, you know, interviewing with African-American parents about this, you know, how they thought about this nature stuff. And um, I always remember a salient comment from one African American woman who has said, "You know, this is what this is what we grew up with as kids. You know, when we were kids, we were outside all the time on our own. We, you know, were in the garden. We were muddy all the time. So this, you know, so it's not an inherent part of African American family experience to be urban." which is what we kind of think of, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, this is, the, this is what we did as kids. This is what we want for our kids. And it was great, it was, it was good. Cause I, you know, suffered from that African-American family's urban, you know, mindset and it was not like that, so. 
Okay, that's amazing. And, and I actually haven't heard the term culturally responsive before. So that's clicking through in my brain and how, how mm-hmm. to be responsive. So that's um, fantastic to provide learning and, and to deepen vocabulary and understanding about things. Now I'm going to take this next one, Jade. I've got a question here about uh, um, visual arts. So this is from Wendy and looking for success stories using the visual arts and connecting with nature-based education. And we actually hosted a workshop on this with an incredible art- artist a few weeks ago. So I'll pop a, a video in the chat that you can watch later, but it'd be great to get your perspective on that, David. Who's the one, I'm trying to think of the, the British Columbian woman who's the arts and nature person. Uh, you guys must know her. The, the woman we had on was Paulina Stankowski, but I don't know it's- uh, No, that's not, this is not her. This is Mar- the woman- Marguerite, Marguerite. Yes, it's Marguerite. Yeah, whoever suggested, what's Mar- Marguerite Hughes, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so that's, whoever asked that question should go look at Marguerite Hughes' website. What's, and again, Gail, if you were the person, what's her, what's her website or organization called? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm gapping that at the moment, but I just called the name. (laughs) Yeah. So search Marguerite Hughes. She's somewhere in some, she's somewhere right in the South Central British Columbia area. She does the most interestingly, wonderfully diverse uh, visual arts stuff with natural materials with kids. Uh, Almost one of the most interesting that I've ever seen. So she's a great example. I think it's of, um, I think it's Marganita, Marganita Hughes, and she's in Kelowna. And, yes, and it's called right. edu- educating the heart through nature art. Yes. Okay. Good. I'm Look at this. This is networking at its finest. This is glad the hive mind going at, going at full tilt with the worker bees bringing all the honey to the team. This is amazing. <laughs> she's a great example. There are also there's a lot. What's happening in a lot of cases is there's this gradual merging of Reggio Emilia approaches, which really are, are all about um, you know, visual arts and the hundred languages of arts for kids and nature-based programming. And so that school that I mentioned, uh, the Sabbath School in Richmond, Virginia, has a really good art teacher there who's done some writing. I'm not going to be able to remember her name, but if you look at the Sabbath School in Richmond, that would have some good example of visual arts and nature-based education. Thanks, David. Um, looking at the time, you know, we're dwindling to a nice intimate group of 180 odd people here, so this is great. Obviously, no interest in the subject at all. Um, well, I'm getting- I'm, I'm wearing thin, so not maybe one more question. Let's, I was, yeah, let's call it at one more, and then we'll follow up with some links to resources and that type of thing. And then hopefully, you know, in a number of months, we can host David again. Uh, so, Jade, did you have a, a final burning question from somebody that you wanted to, to pose? Nope, you're just on mute. Ta-da. Okay. Um, Amy asks, I'm interested uh, when you mentioned the tiny trees program in Seattle, keeping their costs down with using parks. How do they let the kids really feel free on the land that is shared space with the community? I'm currently running a program out of a park and trying to find a balance there. So land yeah. use. Yeah, you, you want it. This person wants to talk to the Seattle people. I just interviewed them about this issue about a month or two ago. Um, they, uh, it, you know, it works really well in some parks and it doesn't work well in other parks. And so you have to do, um, yeah, there's two different ways to go with this. One is that, um, you just got to find the park manager or parks organization that's, that's, has the mindset of understanding that this is good for kids and that a little impact is worth the, you know, the value for the kids and the families. 
Um, if you are stuck with a park where you've got um, a kind of restrictive mindset, um, uh, then you have to just take on the task of educating them about why this is good and um, and uh, working out some agreement on you know what kind of what where can we go where impact is going to be less problematic in some of the Seattle parks where they've got a limited amount of space and a lot of kids they rotate their locations so that the impact you know they're here for a month and here for a month and here for a month so that there's limited impact in those areas um, so uh, but you know it's it's work when you when you've got a problem like that the other organization that's done really good work with this is an organization in the United States called Tinker Garden, uh, Tinker Garten. And it's, um, they uh, hire, they train parents to basically offer nature-based programming in parks around the country. And they're in 500 different locations around the United States. And they uh, negotiate, they have a person that does the negotiation between the organization and the parks departments. And so they have a lot of good um, learning about how to, how to proceed with those negotiations. Wonderful. Thanks again, David. And really appreciate you taking the time with our, this awesome group of educators from across the country and beyond. Um, and yeah, on behalf of our team here and all of our partners, uh, we're pleased to provide you as a token of our thanks with a $500 gift card to our outdoor learning store that you can keep and use yourself. You can share with others uh, who might be needing it, um, whatever ways you want to use that. So Great. yeah, thanks again for your time this evening. Yeah, and uh, Duncan, should I send to you that article that uh, kind of summarizes that whole relationship between nature play and conservation behavior, should I send that to you? That would be fantastic. And if there's any other links that you think participants would like, we can include that in our follow-up message with everyone tomorrow. Sure. Okay, thanks for the opportunity, Duncan. As again, I you know, always regret the fact that I wasn't born Canadian. So I'm thrilled with the work that you're doing. Well, as the world continues to change and improve, uh, we look forward to welcoming you back to <laughs> this part of the world. So right. thanks everyone and take care out there. Keep doing the awesome work and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Thank you. Ta-ta. <laughs>